Good morning, folks. Welcome to the Ancient of Days First Christian Symposium on Aliens. I'm Guy Malone, my wife and I of Alien Resistance Ministries. Welcome you, thank you for being here, and thank you for your early support as well. I can't tell you how proud and honored I am to have someone from my hometown of Nashville with such immense qualifications and a brilliant theological mind and an overall fun guy to be around. Please welcome up Dr. Michael J. Bennett. His PhD is in mechanical engineering, and we're honored very much to have him. Love you and bless you. You know, uh, I speak at a lot of technical and scientific conferences, and to my recollection, that's the first time I've been introduced with a shofar, and uh, I sort of like that. I think I'd like to take that with me. <laughs> that's a wonderful blessing, and it's something that I always associate with the Ancient of Days conference. And I tell you, it's, it is uh, a group of people and an experience that is near and dear to my heart. Now, I don't know if many of you all are new, and this is your first experience here at Ancient of Days, but I came as an attendee in 2005. Uh, I've been raised in a very mainstream Christian environment, Christian home, uh, Baptist background, a wonderful Bible teaching, wonderful experience. But for all of the wonderful teaching, uh, I, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to encounter when I came here in 2005 with a list of what I consider now historic speakers. And over the time of being here for that conference, uh, I recognized that the Lord was doing something very wonderful with this community of people. And, and only part of it was related to the content of what's spoken about. Uh, so, some of the more difficult things that are alluded to in the Bible, discussed in the Bible, and that are affecting our way of life today. But when I was in the audience seeing this wonderful, amazing teaching that actually brought me closer to the Bible, it actually uh, re-illuminated parts of the Bible that maybe we'd skipped over, you know, in my upbringing or Sunday school. And it helped me to have a deeper understanding of who God was, what his purpose was, and his mission. And it was a, just a fully enriching experience. In fact, I remember seeing the Holy Spirit really move uh, amongst the group of people. I saw restorations of relationships. Uh, there was spiritual warfare that went on there. And I can remember uh, an older gentleman, a friend of mine, who was a real mentor of mine, he and I just left here with our mouths open, just wondering, what have we just experienced and what have we seen? And so that's something that I've taken with me, and it's really prepared me in the years since then. I think the Lord has really used it as a tool to help expand my eyes to what he's doing within the household of faith and in the body of Christ. And the folks that you hear speak here, I know they don't toot their own horns except maybe when the conference starts. Uh, <laughs> these are individuals that have sacrificed much. They don't have a institutional support behind them. They don't have uh, all of these other groups that are undergirding their activity. They do this because they have a passion and believe they're sharing God's truth as they seek to study together. And the other thing I've observed about this group is this group works together. I've been in a lot of groups, even in Bible prophecy, where everybody goes off in their own compartment and they sort of compete against each other and try to push books. This group works together. They get together, they compare notes, they try to study the Lord, they pray together, they lift each other up. And that's why it's such a privilege for me to be here today. And I just want to make sure that's on the record that uh, I just considered it an incredible opportunity when uh, Brother Guy asked me to come speak uh, the people here who speak are such incredible scholars in the work that they do. And in the radio show that I do, Future Quake, I try to make it a forum where people like themselves and in other cutting edge topics, they have a forum to come and reach a mainstream Christian audience that we reach in Nashville, Tennessee, in the, in the greater Mid-South area, where we actually are on a, a conventional uh, Christian radio station. Uh, the Lord gave us a four o'clock drive time every day where we can bring topics you don't hear elsewhere on Christian radio. And I think that's really what this conference embodies, uh, is talking about issues that should be talked about, that should be conversed amongst Christians. It helps better prepare us for the days that we're in. And I want to thank each of you, the uh, people who are attending today. You've, you've made great effort to be here, and I want to thank you for being here. And also even the people who may be watching these DVDs. These DVDs go out to so many places. Uh, so many people see them and observe them, and I know they have the same transformational thoughts that I did when I first heard this information. And I, and I also want to thank them for taking the time to watch this information and the rest of the speakers that you'll hear as well in this conference throughout the DVDs. Uh, I, I would, uh, if you don't mind, before I get into meat and potatoes and information, I'd like to say a quick word of prayer because 
The information I'm going to show you is, for me, very co complex, complicated and complex. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure that it's presented in a way that's fruitful and that honors Christ. And uh, I want to thank anybody here who's not part of the household of faith that uh, it was curious when you saw an advertisement about this, you wanted to set in. I just want to let you know I appreciate you being here and respect you and respect you as a truth seeker. And I hope you find something useful from what you hear. So if you don't mind, let's just say a quick word. He Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for the privilege of studying your word and studying what's going on in the world and your hand in it. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just pray as a speaker that I would not say anything that would uh, express falsely upon you or an untruth or an information that would not express your will or who you are. Uh, and Lord, I just pray that this would not be a stumbling block, but rather a stepping stone uh, in the spiritual growth and journey of everyone who hears it. Lord, I pray for, for those who are of faith, that they would be strengthened, and those uh, who are seekers, uh, that they would experience the promise you make that those who seek will find. And I pray that they will find, and I just appreciate their uh, honest spirit to be here and to consider these things together. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to get started here, and uh, this is the talk we're going to give, and I, I need to give a little background of this. My um, scenario, how I was asked to speak, is very different than the other speakers. Uh, Brother Guy, I happened to see this presentation that I gave actually just about exactly a year ago to a very unique group of people, uh, and when he saw this and he saw the content, uh, he decided that it would fit in nicely to the content of this conference that's ongoing. And he asked me to present it. And I was thrilled uh, for that because uh, I, I hate to tell you you're getting leftovers because this is information actually has been updated uh, for this conference. But this is information that was presented to, again, a unique group of people. Uh, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so, I was doing some research for my radio show. Uh, and I uh, happened to stumble across this group called the International Institute of Integral Human Sciences. Very innocuous name. Uh, not, not very descriptive, but, but I happened to discover that it was co-funded by the United Nations and the World Council of Churches, which is, which is very intriguing. You would think, well, if you've got a, a church institute and a, and a civil type group like the UN, it's probably something related to um, getting food for people or, or, you know, some kind of help for people in destitute areas. It actually was a religious organization. It's, it's called an NGO, a non-governmental group or organization that actually are the kind of groups that really pull the weight in the United Nations. And this particular group that's funded by both institutions, actually in effect, and I'm paraphrasing here, is creating basically a new world religion. They're creating a new global religion as a political tool to help unite people together. And, and I, I recommend, if you're curious and looking more about this, go to iihs.org, three eyeshs.org, and you can read about it yourself because they're very straightforward on their website. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that really jumps out is they have a uh, new religious order that ministers can be ordained in. It's called the Order of the Transfiguration. And their slogan and what their purpose is, is that they're creating a new humanity for a new world order. Which is a very interesting slogan to pick. But their basic teaching and what they uh, train people to do are things like um, summoning the dead, communicating with angels, communicating with other entities, channeling and psychic behavior is part of the religious ordination, which is very different than what I was familiar with from my, my Orthodox Christian upbringing. It's actually run by an uh, Anglican theologian uh, that runs the organization. And I invited him to come on our show. And so we had a show, and yeah, he did come. Um, he was treated very well, but we asked very clearly about what some of their positions were versus what we understand to be in the Word of God. It was a very curious show uh, around December of 2007. And I uh, felt like that was probably going to be the end of it. Uh, all our shows are archived at futurequake.com, so if you want to hear them, you can just go there under the past shows tab. Well, I got a call not too long after that where I was invited by this uh, same gentleman to be a keynote speaker at an, an annual international conference they have. And this is a conference attended by all of the big names uh, in the field. Uh, we have uh, people that you may have heard of on Discovery Channel, things like Sean David Morton, uh, people like Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, and a lot of people in ufology that speak. And in fact, if you look, and in fact, there's still an archive of the speakers on the brochure on, on their website from 2008, you'll see probably a good third or more are people related to ufology and the UFO religion that's growing. And so they're a big part of participating in this group. And so uh, 
Uh, I, after much prayer uh, and, and seeking uh, some, some wisdom from others, I, I agreed to accept their opportunity graciously. And I uh, went to Montreal, where, where the speech was. Uh, took uh, Brother Chris, uh, one of my pastors from my church, with me. And uh, what we found out when we got there is, for our recollection, there's probably three or 400 people there. I, as far as I know, we were the only evangelical Christians that were uh, present at the meeting. But just about everyone there is involved in some kind of psychic activity, uh, spirit medium, channeler, that kind of thing. And they have cell groups. They actually run cell groups, sort of miniature church-like groups around the world. And uh, so it was very interesting to get to know these kind of people because um, one of the real difficulties that the people had is when people started talking and uh, taking the Bible literally in discussions. And as fate would have it, mine was probably the only, only presentation that went that direction. But as I move forward in the presentation, I just want to make sure you, you understand clearly, I'm speaking to an audience that does not, in, when I perform this presentation, that does not accept uh, as de facto truth the biblical record. And uh, I went under the guise that this was more of a, an academic type fact finding uh, group that was putting information out the table that we'd actually grow and understand what was going on. But I found my information was very different than the other speakers uh, that were present there at the time. So it was a very unique experience. So we can proceed on with the, with the discussion. Now, in the scope of my discussion here, um, what, what this presentation goes into is in line with the original uh, uh, focus or scope of their whole conference. Their, their conference was focused on the reconnection of heaven and earth. Uh, they believe that spirit mediums and channelers have been breaking the portal, so to speak, and speaking with beings in the other world up to this time. But the portals are going to get ready to open wide open to the whole earth and to all the people of earth. And so that was the theme of all the speakers. And I, I'm, I'm talking in this presentation, you'll see, about the challenges that happen when heaven and earth collide. And so I present a little bit different uh, perspective than, than most of the speakers uh, is what's going to fall out when this happens. So, so basically, I, I, uh, I'm going to show you here a historical record of the communications between spirit beings that we have recorded in history and what was the aftermath of that communication. And I'm looking at things that, that were classified when they were recorded as a non-divine variety. And I think, uh, I, I think probably uh, uh, our, our, our pastor, Mike Kaiser here, can, can explain these terms better than I can. I think it's called hegeophony versus theophany. So these are beings who didn't say, I'm God, but I'm a messenger, an angel of some type. And then I'm going to share a little bit of commentary from the biblical record, which actually overlaps some of these events that we hear historically. Uh, and it's just a little small uh, portion that I have in here. And then, then talk a little bit about what some, some of the admonitions from the Bible about spirit communications. Uh, some of you in the audience may be participating in these kind of things. You may find this interesting. And then some possible scenarios that I foresee of what the, what the nature of this future reconnection is going to be and the implications of it. And you can see my, basically my tagline at the bottom here is that... Um, I believe that both the biblical record and the non-biblical records that you'll see here agree, actually, that heaven and earth will soon be reconnected. And that while small dimensional portals have been open to date, it's going to wide, wide open. Unprecedented events are going to occur, possibly very soon. And that things basically will never be the same again. Here's some of my underlying assumptions, just so you're aware of, as well as our, our viewers. Uh, in, in the approach that I used in this study. I am a layman in theology. My background uh, straight through my PhD is all in science and engineering. Uh, I have been actively involved in church and a Bible student for some time, but uh, there are limitations uh, in some of the depth I can go uh, theologically other than my own personal study. Uh, and I feel like it's to be honest, anytime you do anything that's more academic or it is to, is to admit where your leap of faith is taken. I believe Francis Schaeffer often referred to this whole concept of the leap of faith. And we all do it. Uh, every scientist does it. Every agnostic atheist does it. There is something where you ultimately accept as truth and you build your foundation and your beliefs on it. And where my leap of faith comes from is that I believe in the accuracy of the biblical record as it's actually recorded. And the reasons why I believe that is the best leap of faith of any to take is that over 1,600 or so years, I see a harmony in the record from the authors over all the books of the Bible, something that's unprecedented of any other book in history. We have a record of prophecy where we have people at a known dated period of time 
spoke the words of God about events in the future. We know they came to pass literally. And in fact, God says in his word that that's a sign to know that I am God when I speak it and it comes to pass. We have eyewitness testimony. We have people, even up to 500 people at one time saw a resurrected Jesus Christ. Many of those people stuck with their testimony until death. They paid for their life believing what they saw and what we have recorded in the biblical record. And then my own personal experience. What I've read in the Bible and the principles of it, I've tested it in my own life, I've tried it, and I've found that it works. And so I have a personal experience that says that, that I can trust it. And, and there's basically three areas that I believe about God's Word. I believe it's accuracy, that what it says is really what happened. I believe it's authenticity, that when it says Daniel wrote something, that Daniel wrote it. Or that when this event happened, that event actually happened. And then it's authority. That ultimately, if we look at all of these very complex issues in life, we have everybody has an opinion. We look at all these different opinions. But for me, ultimately, the buck stops on what the Word of God says. And so that's my final barometer I will use for this information here. And so uh, my goal here in doing this is to try to avoid some kind of pick and choose theology where I can take the parts that fit my thesis and throw away those that don't. Uh, we have to be very honest in what we do. I think the speakers here do a tremendous job of that. In, in one role model, I've mentioned Dr. Heiser. Uh, I think he tries to let the, the text fall where it may, and he will routinely challenge his thesis and his studies, and I think we need to discipline ourselves that way to do it. Okay, we're going to go into the uh, area of historical interactions with spiritual entities. I'm going to have tons of information on each of these slides. I have this currently uploaded at futurequake.com on the front. Um, you'll be able to also see these slides with the DVD as well. So for time's sake, I may not hit all the bullets, but uh, it's supportive information of each of these. So we're going to look at individual events that we have reported in history of these interactions. Okay, I'm trying to start back in the farthest back. Uh, the land of Sumer, uh, the area of the ancient astronauts. And by the way, I'm going to go through a lot of names of kings, other people who I'm going to mispronounce, so just bear with me on that. Uh, if you want to shout out the correct pronunciation, I would not be offended by that. So just, just be prepared for that. The plains of Shinar, where we know where the Tower of Babel was built, where, where the whole empire of Babylon was created. Uh, it's known by many names in the literature. Uh, in its language, it was known as the land of the watchers, or, or Anunnaki is another word that you read in the literature. Uh, and evidently, a land of some beings of some type that had influence over the people there. Uh, and there's all sorts of other records in the Egyptian records. Uh, uh, they even refer to these gods who came from this area, came to Egypt. So they had influence in the Mesopotamian area, came to Egypt. Uh, and even their Book of the Dead refers to these watchers as being something you need protection over. Now, in modern era, looking back at, at the interaction of these creatures, whatever they were reported on the ancient records, some more modern writers like von Donneken, probably one of the most famous authors in ufology and chariots of the gods, says that these, these creatures were actually um, ETs, extraterrestrials that came, uh, contacted these people, and actually controlled them for their own purposes and their own ends. And then his claim is that these people became in the, the limited writing record, the gods of mythology. Uh, and he even goes to so far as to say that these pictures where you see animals and humans together, that these were evidence that they were ge genetically made. Uh, two gods that I find that play a prominent role in their, their theology that I think is important because it really establishes sort of a, 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 a two-pronged approach worldview. There's a Judeo-Christian worldview, and then there is a, another worldview that has survived throughout history. And part of that, that other trail involves in Samaria two particular gods, Enki and Enlil. And uh, I, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but just to give you a general idea, that they see Enlil as the original creator that created the heavens and the earth, but doesn't have a, very many positive attributes. He tends to be a very jealous, vengeful kind of person. Uh, whereas Enki is, is considered their light bearer, what we know as Lucifer in the scriptures, uh, who is told in this record, in their view, that he looked out for mankind. In fact, he warned Noah about the flood coming up. And he also was the provider of knowledge to mankind. So in their record, you see this, this other contraster to the uh, creator being the light bearer and the giver of hidden wisdom or information to mankind. Uh, and, and then we see other records that are very interesting. Uh, you look at the god Dagon, who's uh, talked about with the Phoenicians as, as their god, a fish god. The Greeks, believe, I believe, call him Moanus or something to that effect. 
They actually believe he came up out of the water uh, in the area of Babylon and came and instructed men in all the technologies, information, arts, things like this. And so that goes throughout their record, was that some outside entity came in and influenced world civilization. And that has been preserved in these, the, the pagan belief system since then. And then we see similar reports around the world in China, India, around the world, they talk about flying disc and uh, these beings coming at the same time with information. Okay, getting a little bit closer, still in the ancient world, the Oracle of Delphi. Everybody came, citizens, kings, everyone came to this location at Delphi to see the oracle to get answers. And the reason why is there was a, there was a group of priests who interfaced with the people, and then there was this, this oracle that would actually lean over some area where they were burning some leaves and would sniff these noxious fumes and say these mysterious words that the priest would then say, well, here's the answer you're looking for. Here's what's going to happen in the future. Sort of like your magic eight ball, so to speak, you know. Uh, they'd ask them the question, they'd do their bit, and they'd give them the answer. And one famous incident you'll see in the literature, there was a king in Lydia who uh, was skeptical, sent somebody out to ask something, and he, he wanted to also ask them, what am I doing right now? He didn't go. He stayed in his land. And they said, well, he's cooking in a bronze pot and eating some fish and this and that. Turns out they got back at the same time he was doing the same thing. So not only was he sold that they somehow got some information, but that story spread elsewhere around the world. So the whole concept of oracles to get information from the other side lasted for over a thousand years. And, and there would be oracles that would take their place. Well, uh, it was interesting. They had a sliding scale. If you were a regular citizen, they charged you two days' wages. If you were a military person, they assumed you had more money, they raised their amount. So we see a merging of uh, sort of a little business growing out of this whole uh, process of contacting the other side. Uh, that lasted really in force until about A.D. 362. Uh, the oracle said, mm, the age of Apollo is over, because they felt Apollo was down in that pit telling them, which is very interesting because you read the Hebrew version of his name in Revelation being in a pit uh, as well. But they said, oops, it's over. And so it really it was thought to have died out. But now we have evidence that people are going back and doing these same practices today. They're trying to set up the same thing and get oracle data, reproduce the techniques and rituals that they did. There were other oracles. Uh, there was one for Zeus who spoke through the oak trees. When the oaks would blow, they would get information. And the Roman augurs. So this was a whole system of communicating, getting information from the other side. Now, Kabbalah. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but what's, what's interesting I find in the structure that they built, it, this becomes the mystical, esoteric offshoot of Judaism. Uh, they focus on something they call sort of a metaphysical tree of life. But the number 72 keeps coming over and over and over again, where they talk about these ministers, uh, or 70, these 70 ministers over the 70 nations. So they... they, they emphasize this idea that there are these heavenly hosts controlling the other nations of the earth as well that are powerful beings. Not God, but powerful beings. Uh, you'll find that aspect of it even consistent with some other Christian theologians like Dr. Heiser and others have talked about that there was a time after the tower when, as the Bible says, the nations were numbered according to the number of the sons of God, or B'nai Elohim. So there begins an influence of these other beings that's on a national scale, and they talk about that. However, uh, what you'll find was within mainstream Judaism, um, they still understand, at least in, in portions of it, that, that God warns against conjuring spirits. And that's what they attempt to do, is to get information from using these rituals and techniques to get information from these entities. In fact, one quote I found from the 13th century, the Book of the Devout, from a what we'll call more mainstream um, uh, scholar of Judaism, says, if you see one making prophecies about the Messiah, which is the main thing that, that they did in Kabbalah, you should know that he deals in witchcraft and has intercourse with demons, or he has one of those who seeks to conjure the name of God. Now, since they conjure the angels or spirits, uh, these tell them about the Messiah so as to tempt him to reveal his speculations. The demons come and teach him their calculations and apocalyptic secrets in order to shame him and to those who believe in him. So the demons have an active role to, to try to mislead people, to give them information they think is truth, maybe even something they think is godly. But, but, it's, a, but it's an old uh, practice that they've been exposed on. 
So th th this actually gets a revival in things like uh, Solomon's Key, where in the modern occult revival, they go back to these grimoires or ability to summon these demons. And in the modern era, now they're repracticing these same techniques and beliefs as well too. Even Aleister Crowley, some of you may be familiar with, he used their techniques of summoning these uh, 72 angels or demons, however you want to call them, uh, ones like Baal, for example, and others. Uh, but, but one of the things they're known for is they've con consistently tried to handpick who was going to be the Messiah of Israel, and it hasn't worked out to date for them. Uh, and even the tarot cards, there's a relationship that I've uh, read in the literature between what they're picked for these angels or beings were and, and the definition of why they picked 72 tarot cards. And, and I'll just mention a little aside here. There was a panel session after I gave my talk last year at the UN meeting, and one of the panel people was actually a Kabbalah expert, which was sort of interesting after I gave this talk. And he said that he admitted in front of the audience, he's, I've got the audio, that he says, we have known for a long time that Jesus was the Messiah, but there was a big cover-up. And it went, goes way back to around the time of Christ. And he said this on a public record, so I just found that rather curious. Dr. John D. Okay, he's known to be sort of a magician, or astrologer, kind of mathematician in Queen Elizabeth's court. And he actually ended up being imprisoned by Queen Mary for sorcery, although he, I, I think he did help somewhat Queen Elizabeth. Now here's a story of a man who wanted to serve God by his testimony, wanted to, to um, be able to be a servant of his, but he had a, a tremendous intellect, and he really wanted to know the deeper things of the world. And, and unfortunately, that led him to take extreme measures to try to find that information. And what it led him to do is to do something called scrying, where they actually have a crystal ball. And they use this as a technique to contact these spirits. And he used a medium, a, a gentleman, Edward Kelly, to be able to do this. And um, they practiced and learned something from this angel they contact called Enochian magic. And it's basically a three-dimensional alphabet that has some kind of power when it's organized in a certain way, when it's recited in a certain way. And it was some powerful uh, language from beyond that could do things. And ironically, the um, uh, Aleister Crowley and other people today in the modern movements have taken that and are reusing it. And they consider that the most powerful form of magic. But, but it said, just to, to say some of the comments that were conceived by him, it said that he was looked upon as a caller, a conjurer, of wicked, damned spirits. Uh, he thought he saw himself as a pious Christian, but others said that he sought wealth, that he operated in secret. He worked with another secret group called the Rosicrucians. But if you notice on there, one thing that really caught their attention is one of these entities they were talking to said that Jesus was not God, that prayers should not be made to him, and, and uh, sin did not exist. Re reincarnation was a reality, and it terrified the, the medium that was doing this. What do those particular beliefs relate to? How many New Age conferences have you been to with those same exact phrases? These ancient records say the exact same thing. Okay, Muhammad. You typically don't think this kind of thing with Muhammad, but this other monotheistic religion was born out of a communication between, according to Muhammad, Muhammad's testimony, uh, he was... Uh, he was seeking information in a cave, and he says Gabriel came to visit him, okay? Uh, eventually, he said Gabriel took him to Jerusalem. He met Jesus, Abraham, and Moses, okay? Now, in the early years of his, if you studied uh, Islam, there was a lot of violent clashes. It was almost like a violent uh, overthrow that occurred to convert people. There, there was other developments going on, political and elsewhere then, too, but that was basically the order of the day. The main claim they made was that um, Christianity, that Christianity and Judaism had their text corrupted. And what Gabriel was doing was telling him single-handedly to Muhammad that what all they had done through all those years was wrong and he was going to get the right message of what the texts are. And part of that belief was, was that Jesus was not divine, he was not the Son of God, even de uh, denying the crucifixion of Jesus. So when I have to look at a testimony like that, where you're throwing out the whole baby in the bathwater, my question is, what credibility do you have for me to accept this kind of belief? And to my understanding, there's no evidence that I can find that Muhammad or that a new revelation was prophesied or foreseen earlier in the Older New Testament that we should have expected to see 
him on the scene. As, as we know with Jesus, when we know he was testified that he was on the way in the Old Testament very clearly, um, we don't have any kind of record of that. Although, ironically, he's highly regarded by the Mormons. And, you, and from the next slide, you'll see maybe there is sort of a connection there. But he, ha, he uh, showed for, for this virtue of ideology and belief of God, he was very pragmatic as a political leader. Uh, and in fact, you'll see some of these quotes here where he actually, it says from his own biographer, um, he will do basically whatever he needs to do to get the job done, to incorporate other people into the belief. He'll, he'll take positions that might be counter to what he said before. And one example at the bottom is he was trying to take over the city of Mecca and the people there, and they believed God as religion. And so he actually said that there, there were the reality of other goddesses, whereas Islam says there's only one God, to get them a part of it. And then later he recanted. He said he was fooled by Satan, and Gabriel punished him. But yet we are to believe that, that his vision was the vision that we should throw out all the other testimony of the thousands of years to follow. Okay, here's another case that has some similarities. Joseph Smith, he said he saw God at 14 year old. His, his ministers told him it was a demonic delusion to just knock it off. But, but he, he continued to see these visions. And he was told one thing is all Christian denominations are wrong. Everybody's got it wrong. He's gonna get the right story. And then he had this angel Moroni, which later it was identified as Nephi. Uh, and he was, this, this is where this information started coming, including these gold plates that were shown. He had a very troubled life. He had a lot of criminal conviction problems. Um, but he did get 12 other men involved. They said they saw some of these things as well too. They even said that the apostles appeared to these men and, and said that the priesthood should be reinstituted. Okay, he ran some kind of uncharted bank sort of on the fringes of the law to try to raise money for the group. Uh, many people don't know he became a master mason. Actually, part of their trick across, he got into masonry. And the strange thing is uh, this famous Morgan gentleman who was actually killed by the masons because he revealed their secrets, which caused real trouble for, for the masons. His widow was married by Joseph Smith, the curiosity of history. But a very, very turbulent period, violent death. But obviously it grew into an international religious movement. It's very strong worldwide now, not just in the U.S. But what they say is that the churches had corrupted the teaching of the apostles. However, from the, from the text that I know, I see no evidence that the apostles supported a priesthood or reinstituted. In fact, the book of Hebrews clearly shows that Jesus himself is our high priest. Our polygamy or any of these other unique beliefs. And of course they say that, the, that Jesus came to the new world and things like that and, and we're still waiting to find some kind of physical proof of that. Okay, here's a couple guys who were also people who became well known from revelations they got from somewhere else. And these are some quotes I want to read because they're very enlightening to process the rest of the information. Uh, Emanuel Swedenborg, uh, and he, he was an angel medium, actually very influential in religion. Uh, he rejected Christ's atonement and eternal punishment. Here's what, what he says about spirits, and he talks to them all the time. Spirits narrate things wholly false and lie. When spirits begin to speak to man, care should be taken not to believe them. For most everything they say is made up by them and they lie. So if we permitted them to relate what heaven is and how things are in heaven, they would tell so many falsehoods and with such strong assertion that man would be astonished. Wherefore it is not permitted me when spirits were speaking to have any belief in what they stated. They love to feign whatever may be the topic spoken of they think they know it, and if man listens and believes, they insist and in various ways deceive and seduce. Now, we're in a city this week where we have many, many thousands of people looking for those entire messages, and they are basing their life decisions on the information being revealed through some medium from these same spirits. Here's another quote from Nostradamus. Uh, this comes from uh, a section from one of his biographers. It says he indicated how it's possible for the diviner to open the mind to divine inspiration. Almost in the same breath, however, he beseeches his infant son never to dabble in such practices, for he says they desiccate the body, disturb the mind, and send the soul to perdition. I don't see that quote a lot in the documentaries on TV about Nostradamus, but I don't think he's recommending to pursue this further. Okay, moving along the timeline. The modern spiritualism movement. It's typically considered by my knowledge 
And I got a lot of this information from Chris Pinto of Adulum Films. I highly recommend his Maghetto documentary series. He has one, Maghetto to the New Age. It provided a lot of useful information. Margaret Fox in Hydesville, I believe, New York, 1848. Um, a spirit began talking to her and her sisters. It, the word spread about it, and then this happened to more people. Um, and it really became, from what I understand, sort of a, a, a parlor game for the wealthy. They have seances and hear spirits and knocking and try to talk to the departed. Uh, but many in society are very powerful. Our, our political leaders, uh, industrialists, others took it very, very seriously. Uh, and the spirit that first started contacting said a new era was starting and also mentioned that there was no such thing as death. Again, promoting this whole idea of reincarnation and, and, and going on. Uh, just a few people that came out of this, there was a Dr. Quimby who became an extremely well-known healer. Uh, he was the one who started saying these things that we now recognize the New Age movement, that Jesus was a man with higher wisdom. Mary Eddy started the Christian Scientist. She also said that the Bible had a lot of errors she corrected, but that there was no sin and no death. A consistent theme we're finding. Uh, another healer came, Andrew Davis. He says he met with the ancient uh, uh, Dr. Galen in Swedenborg, channeled them. Uh, just skipping down a few of these, even the government uh, has been involved in this. This is well-documented fact, it's not rumor. CIA, KGB has been involved in ESP, remote viewing, even something they call psychotronic weapons, which actually affect brain waves. And if you watch your TV this week, you'll find out there's a new toy coming out on the market where they take your brain waves to, to move a ball and do other kind of things. They've got people moving, and there's really some neat things, people in wheelchairs being able to move with brain waves and things. But this is now becoming mainstream. Okay, now obviously these spirit contact TV shows have been really popular on television. And we, we really can't tell when they talk to these people whether they're talking to their dead loved one or some well-informed spirit. And, and, and there's no means by which they test these spirits. Uh, and then there's even fact where they've reported in the literature things they call some kind of physical something left behind of their uh, 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 presence there, some morphogenesis, like a, a slimy residue that's left on the medium when they have these seances or even some kind of clouds, murky clouds. And I find that very interesting. And obviously I'm, I think most of these things were hack, you know, quackery. But for those who may have been true, it, it, I've noticed in scripture that when the portals open up to the heavenlies or even infernal ones, usually clouds form. When God appears or when other, you know, things like this, you, you see the black furnace open when the abyss opens. So this may be a sign sometimes that something a little bit more Credible, I don't, I'm not saying good, but credible is going on. Uh, and so real physical manifestations begin to occur after time. Okay, another extremely important figure, Elena Blavatsky. She founded the Theosophical Society in 1875 and is really considered the matriarch of the modern New Age movement. She really put it all together. I don't think they've really advanced things much since her. Maybe added the UFO twist to it. Uh, she got her information from ascended avatars but a lot of people that are really famous today and impacted our daily lives, like Thomas Edison, Margaret Sanger, very influential politicians were right on board with her. And people who've written our school textbooks for our schools, people that run things like Planned Parenthood, people who run our, our key elements of society followed her belief system. And here's, here's some of the nice comments she makes. She says, the Appalachian Satan belongs by right first to the, uh, to the first and cruelest adversary of all gods, Jehovah, not the serpent, which only spoke words of sympathy and wisdom. And then another quote from her, Satan, the serpent of Genesis, is the real creator and benefactor, the father of spiritual mankind. Now remember back to the, back in Sumer and their beliefs of Enki and Enlil, we've seen those same shadows going throughout history. There's two versions of what happened in life and what impacted mankind. Makes, makes things simple, two choices, A or B. Okay, and then the concept she came up with, these At Atlantean or Lemurian root races, was actually used by Hitler to espouse Aryanism, that there was some pure race of elevated capabilities that came back from the areas of, um, uh, of uh, Tibet. They migrated here. And that whole belief system and that these other people were inferior races was used particularly by the SS they had a completely clean conscience when they killed the Jews because they were taught that these people would be reincarnated as something worthwhile. Currently, they were not worthwhile, but they would come back better. So their belief system, religious system, completely explained and exonerated their consciousness to do the horrible things they did in the concentration camps. 
Uh, it's a surprise how many people don't understand that, that the swastika, the veneration of swastika came from Blavatsky and from the New Age movement through to Hitler when, when this was presented to him. Now he had a spirit guide and he actually began taking drugs to actually contact the spirits through his mentor, Dietrich Eckert. And one of Eckert's quotes on his deathbed before he died, after he had trained Hitler, he says, follow Hitler, I've initiated him into the secret doctrine. Same kind of language used in the New Age movement opened his centers of vision and given him the means to communicate with the powers. And amazingly, he has this amazing rise to power. And so, you know, in fact, it goes to the fact that, you know, they've actually found these Tibetan monks in Berlin that they had kept there to use for their religious purposes when, when they invaded Berlin, the, the Allies. Okay, here's some quotes just to tell you the impact. This first gentleman, David Spangler, is if people understood how influential he is on a global scale, uh, you would be shocked. Some people do. He runs organizations that really define the agenda of the global UN movement, uh, which is very interesting quoting this when I was speaking to a UN audience. Uh, he says, Lucifer comes to give us the final gift of wholeness. If we accept it, he is free and we are free. This is the Luciferic initiation. It is one that many people now and in the days ahead will be facing, for it is the initiation of a new age. Now this woman, Barbara Marks Hubbard, is a prominent teacher in New Age circles. She almost got the vice presidential nomination back in the 80s on the Democratic ticket. She, she just missed by whisker of, on the ballots of, of doing it. She's had a big influence even in some evangelical circles. Uh, here's some of her quotes from her channel, Spirits Have Told Her. She says, the choice is, do you wish to become a natural Christ, a universal human, or do you wish to die? People will either change or die, that is the choice. So this is the, the soft, cuddly side of the, the New Age movement. Uh, another quote she had from her, this, this is a quote from her spirit, she channeled. Out of the full spectrum of human personality, one fourth is electing to transcend, one fourth is destructive, and they are defective seeds. Now as we approach the quantum shift from the creature human to the co-creative human, the human who's the inventor of godlike power, the destructive one fourth must be eliminated from the social body. Unfortunately, you are not responsible for this act, talking about her. We are. We are in charge of God's selection process for planet Earth. He selects, we destroy. We are the riders of the pale horse, death. So, you know, that's not quite a, the kind of loving, hey, I'll lift you up, brother. Let's all just grow together kind of spirit. This is what's said to disciples. Okay, Aleister Crowley. Having all these wonderful, sunny figures here. Aleister Crowley. Uh, his biographer says it was some kind of homoerotic experience he was experimenting with that led to his encounter. A portal was opened with an eminent deity in 1986 or 1896, started as a cold interest. And then he tried to, his first phase was to try to get hold of a guardian angel. But, but one of the things he's most famous for is something called the Elementra Working, 1918. Uh, he, he was the, the, the really modern expert practitioner of magic in the occult. And he says he created a vortex, using this old Enochian mag magic and derivative syrup, to create a vortex between the seen and unseen, and this present called Lamb came through, which the pictures he drew looks just like the, the alien grace. If you all study this, I'm sure you've seen it. But, but he used, built on this magic of what was delivered by these angels before. And then he had another revelation from this person, Iwas, who said he's a messenger of the forces ruling this earth. And he recommended using strange drugs now, remember, who, who does Antichrist worship? He worships the God of forces. I believe in the book of Daniel says. Uh, some of the quotes of this, uh, this messenger, with my hawk's head I peck at the eyes of Jesus as he hangs on the cross. And this serpent Satan is not the enemy of man, but he who made gods of our race. And what they plan to do, their operation, is the initiation of a new eon. Uh, then the whole planet will be bathed in blood. And the bloody sacrifice is a critical point of the world's ceremony of the crown and conquering child. So he didn't stop there. He tried to get a demon out of the abyss and open the gates of hell. And that's why the, the British press, also some horrible things he did to real people at real time was found out, that they called him the wickedest man in the world. But he believed that this new age of Horus would overthrow Judeo-Christianity. And what he got for his faithful devotion to his leader, faithfully supporting him in a message, he died a uh, penniless drug addict. Uh, his wives and lovers were driven mad, and children left to die. Okay, Edgar Casey. Uh, everybody going okay with the pace on this? Everybody comfortable with it? Edgar Casey 
Uh, his family business is well connected with Freemasonry. Uh, he found that he had transinduced psychic abilities after he went under hypnosis. So he went under a hypnosis of it, and all of a sudden his life changed. He had these new features. Uh, he was invited to give readings at the White House for President Wilson. Uh, other top-level government officials and celebrities routinely came to him in Hopkinsville, Kentucky, to get readings. Uh, some of the things he taught, he said he was a Christian, but when you read his th theology, he believed in this thing called Christ consciousness, in the reincarnation of Christ and other biblical characters, and that self-deification was possible. Okay, he's going his own thing, but really doesn't this match up to the, to the New Age alternative view, and that hidden wisdom could aid man's uh, quest as well as these uh, great spirit guides. He said that the spirits told him that in the future a great initiate would lead humanity into the age of Aquarius. So they're looking for their one person ruler too. Um, and that, uh, of course, he had some things that didn't work out too well. He thought uh, Atlantis would arise in 68 out of the water and then LA and San Francisco would be destroyed. Um, but a lot of his work involved uh, things about the Great Pyramid. And one of the other great esoteric writers, as far as notoriety, was Manly P. Hall, who commented on his channel messages and said, the time will come when the secret wisdom shall again be the dominating religious and philosophical urge of the world. And, and I believe the group that I spoke at last year is evidence of that. Uh, it says, the day it's hand when the doom of dogma will be sounded and out of the cold ashes of lifeless greeds shall rise phoenix-like the ancient mysteries. And let me just remind you, the group that I spoke to last year, their emblem of the Triple IHS is a phoenix rising out of ashes. That is their, their emblem. Uh, it says, the dying God shall rise again in the secret room of the house of the hidden places shall be rediscovered. The pyramid shall again stand as the ideal emblem of solidarity, blah, blah, blah. Now, what did Jesus say when they said, many are going to come and say, Jesus is here. They say, look, look out in the desert. He's here, but do not believe that. Look, he's in the hidden chambers. Do not believe that. Look at that last quote. Okay, Jack Parsons. He was a founder of a rocket company, Aerojet, very popular defense contractor today. And he was co-founder of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, one of our national labs. And he is considered the most critical contributor to the U.S. space program. He is really the father of, of modern rocketry. He also just happened to be in his satellite, the top occultist in the U.S., a disciple of, of Crowley. He was, he was Crowley's man in the U.S. and the head of a group called the OTO, which is one of the most occult groups that does some of these practices. He, he uh, came up with a nice jingo of the Antichrist for his name. But he did something similar to that Alamantra working, took it to the next level. He did something called the Babylon working, January of 96, or 46, excuse me. And he worked, of all people, L. Ron Hubbard of Scientology fame, who had recently joined his group. They went out together in the desert and did this old, old magic ritual work to open a portal for the great whore Babylon. And you know, after all my years of studying the Bible, the first time I heard about this was at Ancient of Days 2005 when William Schnoblin brought this up. And I had to go home and do some homework and I was shocked to find out what went on. Um, and so he was intending this great whore Babylon to be a consort for the Antichrist. And they say in their writings, they actually saw some kind of corporal manifestation that actually occurred from the witnesses. Uh, basically what did happen to Parsons after all that? He was, a, he was a great hero in the defense area. He ended up being betrayed by L. Ron Hubbard, who took his wife and his money, lost his job. FBI got concerned about what the things they were doing. He had a very mysterious, violent death. Uh, but I'll just point out that this era we're talking about. Think about all the things that happened around this era of time. We had, from the middle of 45, we had the first atomic test where we we're actually showing our ability to destroy the world. This Babylon working occurred a few months later. We had the death of Crowley in 1947. We had the Roswell and other UFO sightings happen in 1947. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947, which also included ancient books like the Book of Enoch, which showed how old they were and, and how they were revered by, by the Judeo-Christian world, which actually gives an explanation for what may be going on here. And then we find the finding of the nation Israel. So it just makes one wonder if there was something of real spiritual significance going on in that period of time, and that maybe some kind of portals were opening up and there were activities on both sides that just were taken up a notch, maybe suggested we're entering into the, the last days. Okay, this is a new slide I added. This fellow, William Branham, is, is really revered by a lot of uh, uh, portions of, of Christianity 
And I put some of these in here just to be fair, to show some examples on all sides. Um, but William Branham has some curious things as well. Uh, he was the father of the modern era faith healer movement. And he had a very early vision as a young person, although he had very little Christian teaching or influence as a child, exposure. Uh, but, but he had this prophetic vision and then an astrologer came to him and told him that he believed he was born under a special sign. And he took that as from the astrologer's endorsement from God. Uh, and he said he considered it like, if you remember the divining spirit, the woman that was had a spirit in her and kept saying, this is Paul and this, these are the great things he's doing. Of course, you know, Paul rebuked her. Uh, but he began a healing ministry about the same period of time as these other things. And then he says he has angelic visions in 46 that began the modern healing revival. Tens of thousands of people, tremendous response worldwide. But he says in, in the 60s that he met angels to open up these seven seals of revelation. And it was said by others that he could read people's minds or had discernment. Uh, but some of the things he didn't quite write, he thought that the millennium was going to start in 1977. But now still many believe him to be some, uh, a great prophet. But, but most of your modern day healers you see on TV sort of came out of, of what he did. Now some of his theology is not very popular within most of Christianity. He believed in a oneness Pentecostal belief, no Trinity, no, no Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, you know, manifestations of God. Uh, and he also taught about something called the serpent seed, uh, with Eve and Satan having intercourse, having children that Cain came from. It's very, very interesting. Now, I think you all know about a lot of this, so I'm not going to spend much time on this. Um, but as you've heard, uh, and you'll hear from other speakers at this conference, people like Jacques Vallée, who is really considered by most everyone to be a very, very credible, capable researcher, uh, says very clearly that when you look at all the data, that it typically fits a classic historical demonological pattern. And when you see things like cattle mutilations, this focus is on, again, reproductive organs, on some kind of reproductive event, uh, and even abduction stories talk about some program that they witness of hybridization. And I'm not getting into whether these things were happened in their mind or, or were physical manifestations or not, but it's a continuous theme, and that's why other researchers at Ancient of Days and elsewhere have talked about it looks like the kind of events that are recorded that happen related to Genesis chapter 6, uh, where the sons of God, the Ben Elohim, came down, they mated with the daughters of women, and the Nephilim were born. Uh, if, you, if you believe other books that are even quoted in the Bible, like the Book of Enoch, uh, that gives more information, it talks about all sorts of kind of reproductive, strange things that they were doing and probably helped add to the cause for the great flood because God says there was great, great wickedness on the earth. And it's very curious when you find the, the, the text that talks about Noah. It says he was pure in his generations. So it became very, very critical to understand that this whole genetic issue was, was critical to our kinsman redeemer through Jesus Christ being born to rescue mankind and preserving it. And that's an issue for another day, but it really helped a lot of complicated things in the Bible become clear to me when I understood this teaching. Um, you've seen the data. Um, Harvard professor John Mack, who's uh, now the head of the psychiatry division, said by his data he has a good feel that four to five million people believe they've had an abduction experience. George Gallup had polls twice that said between one and three percent of the public. Uh, that's information that just blows my mind. But the, the same message here, unite the religions and the government, this is what all the contactees are told, except our ET creators are going to be returning soon. Except some of the most prominent ufologists, the kind of people who were speaking in this town this week, have told me privately that they all understand that these ETs lie to them. And they just sort of laugh it off like, yeah, we know. They even masquerade as dear departed loved ones. And sometimes the people catch them with their facts wrong. And then they'll say, no, no, I'm not Uncle Bill, I'm, I'm Aunt Mary. And so, you know, but what's sad is these people just brush it off, but then they take seriously their message and their theology. Um, what's interesting as far as the response within the religious community, the Vatican for some time has been preparing the public for some extraterrestrial disclosure. Many people don't know they have some of the biggest systems of observatories in the world. And the, the science world really regards work at the Vatican observatories. And, and their head teachers in this area have been preparing people that you're going to hear disclosure soon, don't get you know, weirded out, it's okay, church is still in control. 
Um, and in fact, I had Linda Moulton Howe on our show recently, some of you may know, and she had mentioned on our first visit on the show that uh, government people had told her that they understood that these hybrid non-humans were dispersed in the public and that that was one of the biggest concerns they had. So uh, I, I can't verify any of that, but it's very curious when you look at the image of Daniel, the statue, you read it in the King James, it talks about the iron mixed with clay and the feet and the toes of the last days, that it says they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. And it makes you wonder who is they is and why are they different than the seed of men. So maybe something where they could look at further. Um, I'm going to skip through this. I know our time's getting by as quickly. But uh, the uh, Council of Nine is a separate group that uh, uh, has brought in some top name people who are spirit mediums. And the, this Council of Nine, these spirits say that they are nine original gods of Egypt. And so they are uh, channeling through these people. Um, in fact, some of the people who've come in this group as channelers, it turns out, had connections to the CIA and to some mind control uh, projects like MK Ultra. So we have this whole thing of this mystical pursuit. You have government people with their agenda infiltrating it. So who knows what kind of agendas are going on here? Uh, some of the people who were used as channels to talk to these people, uh, Yuri Geller, the, the spoon bending guy, uh, people like Dr. James Hurtak, who actually spoke at the same conference I was at, uh, and others. Uh, here's some of the messages they talk about. They're always apocalyptic. Uh, talk about spirit evolution, transition to a new age. Um, and they, they really focus on the Great Pyramid where information is going to be revealed from that here in the last days. Uh, and then the, their last quote here from them, there's a new kind of children amongst you. These new beings that are coming and being born on your planet have sonars in them to help them in their service. And a, a lot of people see this relates to what you hear in the news about these starseed children which actually have their reunion back in Nashville, Tennessee, where I come from, from across the country, or the Indigo children. You've probably heard uh, like ABC documentaries, Diane Sawyer's talked about this phenomenon of these children. Okay. Um, the Marian Expeditions, I really don't have time for this. I would suggest that you, you study that further. But basically these visions, uh, they saw something that they called a silver spinning disc in the sky. Dr. Lynn Marzulli, one of our speakers, has done a lot of work on this as well too in his books. Uh, but some of the things that they, they, the secrets that were out related to the end times, um, there are some that are teaching based upon this vision. There is a key between Islam and Christianity. I find this curious. I really can't interpret it, the significance. They believe because of the veneration of Mary by Islam as well as Christianity, they think that this is a key, these events, on uniting these religions. Um, but it's all about these secrets that are supposed to be happening in the future and three warnings coming soon. But it's actually created factions within the Catholic Church. But people who've actually taken the records of what these people saw uh, said it sounded a lot like a, a UFO kind of thing with the spinning disc and things. I wasn't there, I can't say. Okay, Lord Maitreya. Um, he's, he's one of the most modern guys that sort of pulls all this stuff together. The Avatar of the Aquarian Age, he said he is the Messiah that's going to unite all of these religions, including Buddhism and Hinduism. Uh, he says he magically appears in places around the world and does stuff. And by the way, if you didn't know, he was the guy who ended the Cold War and apartheid. So you can thank him for that. But he has a human herald, Benjamin Krim, who shows up on all the shows. He'll, he'll be really popular for a while and then disappear and come back. Uh, he, he put these articles in these newspapers, and now they've got large funding. This group's really well funded saying the Christ is now here. Uh, they expect the Day of Declaration coming on all TV channels that will announce that he's taken over. Um, and, and Benjamin Krim, the United Nations, has invited this guy to come in to speak. They treat him credibly. Now, I don't know of any evangelical speakers, Christianity, but Benjamin Krim was highly regarded. Uh, he says he receives messages from the Masters of Wisdom and uh, publishes them at uh, his website there. And he, he says very clearly what is his plan. It includes the installation of a new world government and a new world religion under Maitreya. Uh, and he, he gives a little, a little more theology here. He says, Lucifer is the name of a great angel, not an upstart in heaven who revolted against God uh, and became the devil. That is a complete misinterpretation. Lucifer means light, and that comes from the Latin lux, lucius, meaning light. It's the name of the angel who ensouls the human kingdom. So they make it very, very clear where they stand. Okay, here's a couple just new slides I put in, and then we'll try to process this. I know our time's getting away. Um, I was doing some recent study about this chemical DMT and did a show. It's show 157 if you want to look it up in the archives of Future Quake. Um, it's a neurotransmitter that chemical that affects our body. 
perception events. Uh, it is thought to be uh, produced in the pineal gland, the gland right in the center of your brain, it's right where your forehead is, um, and elsewhere in the body, but it is normally neutralized by other chemicals in your stomach that take away its unique properties. But you can overwhelm it. And in fact, what shamans have done in the Amazon and other parts of the world is they, they can get this stuff out of plants and come up with some kind of tea that they drink that overwhelms it. And what happens is almost instantly they start seeing these entities that start telling them information. And most of them say it's a very, very terrifying experience and they have to become acclimated to withstand this experience. So what do we do in the modern West? We think, oh, well, this, this is something we ought to get in the middle of. That'd make a good story. So just one example, National Geographic sent one of their journalists down, and I was reading the article about it. They got in their little religious circle, took the tea. Almost instantly, this person began falling, seeing doom, doomed souls crying. This person was not religious, by the way. They saw these doomed souls crying out that they were trapped and, and doomed for eternity, and they just felt this absolute terror. And then they saw these three thrones established with these beings on them saying, you'll never get out of here, there's no hope for you and just absolute t terror events. And these other people in the circle would try to work to get these people back out. Uh, and I would call them basically consistently hellish experiences. However, it, it's so strange that sometimes these circles, they'll take stuff and they'll see, for example, a serpent. Multiple people in the group take the drug and see the same thing. So there's something going on other than just hallucinations. Uh, Dr. Rick Strassman did actually in the 90s a, a uh, uh, a respected researcher, a clinical psychiatrist, did clinical trials that were funded at the University of New Mexico, right here in the state, in the 90s, and it was documented in his book, DMT, The Spirit Drug. And what happened was when he gave to all this large body of people, he's just clinically taking notes, within a few seconds of the drug administered, they began seeing these grays, these aliens. You know, we, we saw this description, and you know, when people used to say about reptilians and, and all these different ones, I, you know, just wasn't too sure about it. But sure enough, all these people who were pre-screened, had really no knowledge of this kind of stuff, repeatedly kept saying they see these creatures so much that the scientist begins to think there's something to this. It is not a mass psychosis. But these creatures started doing terrible things, rape and other reproductive experiments on them. That, that was just a regular thing they did. And they said these people had a sense that it wasn't like a dream where you'd come back and have a dream again. It was like time had passed. They would know who their name, say, hey, we missed you while you were gone, bring them back in. So what's he going to do? He's got new experiments planned. He's got a new group that's going to do this more. But now there are churches now forming that are built around this chemical DMT. For some reason, they want these experiences. And that's, you know, when you have a thirst for knowledge, like Dr. Frankenstein, that takes you into dangerous areas, you've got to ask, what is that addiction that's controlling you? So I just want to mention, you know, when I, when I saw this, I thought of Revelation 18, where, where you read that the great merchants of the earth, the globalist leaders and their, the kings, use sorcery, and the word there is used as pharmakia, using drugs to contact the spirit world. And through that, they deceive the masses of humanity. And if you really dig into this, and I can't cover all this today, but you'll find evidence that these globalist and prominent world leaders do this very same thing. And I didn't believe it when I first started reading it until I started seeing more and more data that the Bible was literal and real when it said this goes on. And that through this, they use all sorts of things to deceive us through our television sets, through the lies they say from behind the cameras, to, the, to all these things are techniques and the Bible is real in what it says. And it's very interesting. You better be thinking about guarding your heart. We're getting into days where it's gonna be very, very hard with the information you take in to pick and, and, and regarding this whole pineal gland thing, I don't know what to make it. I'm studying further, but you, you see passages like in the Revelation where it talks about creatures coming from the abyss and starts tormenting these people, and they sound a description just like what these people saw. And the only people protected are the ones who are marked on their forehead by God in this area to protect them from these spirits. So there's something going on. There's a portal that God meant to stay closed, maybe out of the garden to, for our protection. But we don't leave well enough alone, and we're convinced to open these portals, and terrible things are getting ready to happen. And you, and you just better guard your hearts and only let the Word of God and the testimony of whatever upright and pure come in there to be able to understand these things. Okay, here's, a, here's one of the last ones I have. These are just some new things I've discovered. There's, there's a program underway right now from the University of Arizona called the SOFIA Project. And I believe there's a whole lot more than this goes on. This is just one example. They are currently conducting experiments. It's right on their website. You can go to the university and see it. It's at their Tucson campus. 
to contact the other side. And what they say, I'm quoting here, they're contacting dead individuals through guides and angels to purported communications with a higher power or divinity or otherworldly beings. Okay, this is funded through the university. Uh, they're recruiting right now. They're actually signing up psychics, mediums, channelers for controlled experiments. It's already underway. They're getting more subjects. Uh, their first study they're doing is called an Entities Communication Study. The first papers I was just told will be published soon. I called them out there. Uh, this is becoming mainstream. You see the merging of science and the merging of not Christianity, but these pagan belief systems, which is hard for me. I'm a man of science. I see God when I study science. I see the handiwork of creation. But they're perverting this and, and combining this together. Okay, this, this group they have, this laboratory, has these eight areas of consciousness studies, including universal consciousness. But when you, they, they say, these are the books that inspired us to do this program. They mention work by Jonas Salk, John Mike's work uh, in you know, alien abduction research. And then they mention uh, Eckhart Tolle, I believe I don't know how you pronounce that, A New Earth, which is a, the main book really pushed by Oprah Winfrey, along with The Course of Miracles and things like this. Uh, people like Edgar Mitchell and the uh, Institute of Noetic Sciences, they're all connected. It's all a network, they're together. Uh, and in fact, it's very interesting, this Dr. Schwartz, he's known to Deepak Chopra, another guy you see on the TV all the time, actually sought his help in contacting his dead father. So you've got a guy teaching over here, we use all of these mind techniques of spirit, but quietly he's doing like a soul, and he wants to go contact somebody, he's going to a spirit medium to find out how to contact somebody. So, listener beware. Okay. Let me just hear, hit, hit a few of these that are in the Bible. Uh, I'm guessing a lot of our audience are pretty coherent of these, but you'll see a pattern, but the Bible gives commentary. It actually gives us a reliable commentary on what's really going on. We have a, a serpent. Um, the actual word meant shining one. Uh, he was more crafty. When the, in, in the Bible, that means that it was sh uh, shrewd or sly than other beings. And what did he do? If we summarized his comments in the garden, I'm sure you're familiar with it. One, he challenged the statements that God made to people. He misstated God's words. He asked whether God even had made the comments, planted doubts in their minds, and then he questioned God's motives in what he was trying to do. And I think you'll find those same things in the slides we just saw historically, that same template. Uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, Eve did what a lot, a lot of people do, maybe some of us, he responded with an erroneous repeat of God's word. Said some things that really weren't even, even exactly what God said, and that caused, that exacerbated the problem further. But what did the serpent prompt? He promised you your eyes would be opened, illumination, and you'd be like God. Okay, you could threaten God's position. And that's really the goal of every illuminated cult and hermetic discipline for millennia, is, is the very quote that he made. Okay, and she accepted the offer. Why? Why are people appealing to this? One, it pleased her eye. It met her vanity about who she could be and elevated. It looked good to eat. It met her fleshly lust, her desires. And it says she desired to gain wisdom. Now, that doesn't sound like a bad idea to gain wisdom. And in fact, God recommends gaining godly wisdom. And he shows in scripture how you can do it. He, he wants to give wisdom to his children. But it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And she is starting down the path by rejecting the fear of the Lord and the gaining of wisdom. Okay, what happened in the aftermath? Well, did they get their blissful ex existence that they were promised? No, their eyes opening the byproduct of shame and loss of bliss. And they end up hiding from the very God who, did, who wanted regular communion with them. And in fact, even God still pursued them even after they disobeyed. And that says who God is. Um, and then did it unite? All, you know, we, we hear these teachings are supposed to unite all humanity. What happened was there was only two people in humanity and it split the two of them. They blamed each other and the deceit of the serpent where they got the information from. But now what did God do? Remember we talk, they, they talk about this vengeful creator God. What God did was punish the serpent for harming mankind. God is the speaker on behalf of mankind, his creation, in holding the serpent accountable. And, and God said, look, you're going to be at war. The seed of the woman and mankind and the seed of Satan, including these evil angelic beings, are going to be at war forever. And that's partly what this conference is about, is the latest on what's going on in that battle. And mankind suffered greatly. The level of our communication with God suffered greatly after that and required great action on God's behalf of restoration. Isn't it very curious that serpent didn't tempt men with the tree of life? Even though it wasn't bad. If you know if his ideas were virtuous, why didn't he go take... And you know, it's very interesting speaking to the group that I spoke there about them thinking about it. Why didn't he offer them eternal life? No, he took something that was going to be something hurt. The one thing that could hurt him is what he offered to them. 
And again, fear, separation, and deception are the byproduct. And God knows how us to reach higher levels, not these others. Fallen man need, first needs redemption before eternal life, and purity is an essential state for God to lift you up to the places he wants you to go. That's the only way to do it in a way that's fruitful and brings life to you. Okay. You know what? There's other people here who are going to speak about this better, so I'm going to skip through this on time um, because they can speak to all of this. Uh, I've learned a lot from some people in Genesis chapter 6 what was going on. Uh, it relates to what, what we were just talking about, that there was a plan of action uh, with the seed of the serpent trying to ruin the plan of the seed of man in crushing his heel. And in, at this stage, it appears they tried to ruin the bloodline of mankind. And that's what I've learned from this. And I think it's consistent in the book of Jude and the other quotations. Uh, I, I'm feeling more and more confident that this is really what happened. And that it, it led to the terrible draconian events that were required for the salvation of humankind via the flood. That God actually, it was not a vengeful act, it was an act of redemption for mankind. And that's why I think people like Mike Heiser and, and others that even though I maybe don't get all the facts straight and don't understand it, they have helped me to understand what many people see are vengeful acts of God's were actually loving acts where a father was taking the proper steps for his children. And I recommend you study this further. This has become chic now, this whole idea of the Nephilim. Uh, there was a show recently on called Fallen that was about a Nephilim. And, you know, of course, he was a very sympathetic character. But uh, it's not just crews like this that are talking about this. It's talked about in mainstream. In, in fact, most of your mainstream churches are about the only place this is not talked about. And it's in the Bible. Okay, Witch of Endor. Again, you're familiar with that story. Uh, here, here you have someone who was serving God that cut corners. He was already falling apart spiritually. Uh, he, he went to a medium. The other ones were chased out of the country because they knew it was wrong. He was already understood to be wrong. Okay? And, and she says some very interesting things. She says, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. So she, she saw more. I mean, a lot of times we skip over that verse, but... There were things that she saw there that were very disturbing. And it, there's other passages in the Old Testament that suggest that these gods, when God is judging everyone, he's going to judge the living and the dead. And in that final rebellion, it, they may be coming up out of the ground for their, their last rebellion. But Samuel rebuked them. And uh, it's not the kind of, you know, most contacty messages are all lovey-dovey. That was definitely not one Samuel gave. Moses and the Egyptians. Now, this is in here because I'm contrasting the Judeo-Christian God versus the gods of this alternative belief system. Okay? They could rep reproduce many miracles, the Egyptian magicians, but they couldn't do everything. And when they found ones that they couldn't reproduce, they told Pharaoh it's the finger of God, which to me that leads by implication that what they were doing was not of God, and they knew it. So they knew that there was a God who was more powerful, and they had chosen not to serve him. And God makes it very clear. People, you know, again, I don't hear them talk about this much when they talk about that story about delivering the children of Egypt. Yeah, he went down there to get his children out of there, but he had another big purpose. He says, against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. He didn't say the people of Egypt. He said the gods of Egypt. And while we focus on the human story here, there are activities going on amongst these rebellious creatures. Call them small g gods. Call them what you will. But God is dealing with them as well as us. And sometimes there's the ramifications here on earth that we don't understand. But we as Christians don't have any excuse not to know that. Daniel was a positive example. Now you can read this later. Um, what did Daniel do? Daniel sought the Lord with all his heart. He did not seek an angelic company. He did not pursue contact. God came to him. He didn't, he didn't try to do any kind of rituals or do any kind of funny stuff. He, he was pleading with God out of mercy for his people in great humility, in purity of his heart, he wanted to be a holy, godly person. And while he was pursuing that, God chose to contact him. And I think that's a key difference in these other people uh, that we see contacted uh, in here. Okay. The first time I'd ever heard until this conference about um, the uh, Jesus being uh, subject to an abduction event, but the more I thought about that, that's very interesting. Because Satan certainly did pick him up and, and temptation to the wilderness. Um, Satan used the same techniques. He tried to distort scripture to further his ends. 
using all these if statements. Same thing he used in the garden. And Jesus didn't bother arguing with the Spirit. All he did was, was quote, Scripture and affirm the authority of God. And that, that's a suggestion. If it worked for Jesus, how about you try it? Uh, and, uh, you know, Satan revealed his ownership over earthly kingdoms. And don't forget that when you watch the political thing going on. And it's not just other kingdoms. That includes here, too. Uh, and he offered them in exchange for worship. He, you know, he said he had them when, when he wanted to give them. And, and the Bible says he's the king of this world. Jesus knew no enlightenment would come from this light bearer. So he didn't even look for it unlike other people. So Jesus didn't debate him. He just dispersed him based on his authority. Now, why would you want to serve a guy who can be so quickly dispersed by Jesus? Why not serve Jesus himself? Okay. Let me contrast Jesus as a, as a contrast to these. Okay? Jesus Christ brought a message, just like these other guys brought messages. But his witness was confirmed by prior revelation of the prophets and the Torah. And, and even a couple of the, the, the biggest uh, leaders of Judaism came, appeared themselves on the Mount of Transfiguration to show their leaders, yeah, that's right, that's what, that's what our writing said. He fulfilled over 300 prophecies. You tell me any of these other people who are giving another gospel that they can make that claim. He was testified by, uh, uh, to others by the Father and Holy Spirit. And he said his signs and wonders were a tool, and this is my understanding, to help the spiritually weak to understand his spiritual authority. He says, oh, you have little faith. You know, you need a sign. Uh, but he wanted the spiritually weak to understand. And witnesses came forward to his resurrection. We have much more confirming data than any of these other alternatives we give. But he doesn't allow us to consider him a great teacher. If you're going to believe that he did all these other kind of things, he also said, no man comes to the Father but by me. He doesn't mention any other avatars of the nine or anybody. Okay. The apostles. Here's, here's when they encountered paganism. Here's, here's what happened to them. Okay. When they became converted to Christ, a number of them who practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them. They were of great money. But they said these cannot coexist. Okay, and then they ran into one of these, these Delphi-type oracles. Okay, there's, there's this girl with a spirit of divination, and her masters were, were making money off of her. And that's what you'll see common with these other characters around here. Okay, and she kept crying out, oh, and you know, she said, these are bond servants of the Most High God. Okay, but Paul, Paul does not want that testimony about God to come from this person. And so he says, look, I commend you in the name of Jesus to come out, and it, it left so, but the problem, that economic thing, you know, there's another God I didn't mention, Mammon, and that other God plays a key role in all this too. There's always a buck to be made as part of this too. Okay, just a few admonitions before I wrap up here. I've probably got, what, about most 10 minutes maybe. Um, the nations that sought diviners were driven out. Okay, God says that the nations who were using these kind of techniques, he drove them out of the land to replace them with his people. Okay. And there shall not be found any among you that, make, that makes his daughter or son or daughter pass the fire or uses definition or observer of times. Okay, they're an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Okay, for these nations which thou shalt, shalt possess hearkened unto observers of times and to diviners. Let's look at American TV. How much do we have people going and going to a Deepak Chopra or some of these people that Oprah speaks to or others? Okay, are we one of those nations by definition? Okay, he says to his own people, give no regard to mediums or familiar spirits. Do not seek after them or be defiled. Okay, and the person who turns after them, he says, I will set my face against that person. Okay, this, this, is, this is no laughing matter. God takes this very seriously. And then he says, uh, you know, seek into them. Uh, he says, when you say, let's seek into those that have some familiar spirits and that mutter, should not people seek unto their God for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So it makes it pretty simple. If you're looking at somebody, boy, are they really pizzazzy. How do they line up with God's word? If not, God will show you how to deal with them. But here's an important warning for you. God says he will send lying spirits to the prophets, uh, to those who are beyond repentance. It says, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord has spoken evil concerning thee. And the reason why is because they disregarded the 
the doctrine and what they taught in the law and God's word, and he gave them over to these deceptive spirits because they rejected it. There are a lot of people in our churches that have left our churches and gone heard these deceptive spirits. Okay, and they're being held accountable by God for that. But we in the church also need to be held accountable to warn them about what's going on. The, the people you hear here speak will be faithful witnesses about this. But you need to go back and look in your own churches and houses of worship and see, are they being faithful in this mission? Okay? The Bible says, and you can read these verses when you get home, that deception will be predicted in the last days that will impact those who do not repent. And then he says that God shall send them a strong delusion that they shall believe a lie. And that's because they have already chosen a lie. Not because God wants to deceive people. It's because they are taking what they've already selected and want. And now is the day of salvation. If you feel like you've been convicted, you're going in that path, now is the day to set the right path. Because there will come a day where it will be on the time for you to make that decision. Okay, it says, For time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine by their own lust. They shall heap themselves teachers having itching ears, probably some of them on TV, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned into fables. Okay? And then they, they, they even uh, make themselves look really good. They transform themselves in 2 Corinthians into uh, uh, light. It says, that No marvel, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. So it's no great thing if his ministers are transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Just because they look good and say nice things and make you feel good, they may say very virtuous things, but that does not suggest where their origin is. Okay? He's, and Jesus said, Take heed no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Okay? And the last comment there, there are certain men that have crept in. The crept in is a good description, unawares. Okay? Ungodly men. And they speak evil of things of which they know not. Okay? Now, Again, this is a point for any of you who are following other angels, if you follow other spirits that are your spirit guides. God's word says that all, if, if, even if you cling to some of the truth of God's word, you, you accept the part that you want to accept, the same, the same scripture, the same utterances says that all spiritual powers will be subject to Jesus' position and authority. When you hear these speakers that speak this week, these, these gentlemen are on the front line using, God, using Jesus' authority to stop these evil spirits and delivering people in their individual lives. I sure would have liked to have seen some of these gentlemen speak before that group that I was at the UN to show them what real power is, the power of, of Christ. Okay, Far above every principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Okay, And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Not just men, but everyone in heaven and earth and under the earth. And here, here's another key point that, that I share to these people. They're, they're, they're looking for revelation everywhere. Maybe they can teach these Christian people, stodgy Christian people, a few things. It says that the church and the Holy Spirit will enlighten the spirits, not vice versa. In Ephesians 3, it says that the manifold wisdom of God will be made known through the church to rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now, that's just through the, the mystery and the wonders of God's grace. It's certainly not because of our capability or wisdom, those who are of the household of faith. It's through God's wisdom. He always humbles the proud. And then in 1 Peter, to whom it's revealed, it's reported to you that by them have preached the gospel and to you the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. The angels may tell you they know something. They want to tell you hidden wisdom. Actually, you were subject to something they want to know something about. Okay? Wrap up here. Last few comments. There are warnings on angelic spirit messages and their messengers. Okay, If you hear anybody preach or an angel, any other gospel, they are to be accursed. Okay? They include the worship of angels in there in Colossians 2.18. Okay? And the last comment in 1 John. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out in the world, and I would submit many of them are in this town right now. And every spirit that does not cry, uh, confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. It's the spirit of Antichrist. There are two sides. There's the spirit of Christ. There's the spirit of Antichrist. Okay? Let me just leave you some, for some guidance here. God and his servants can accurately and reliably foretell even the distant future when he so informs them. 
He says, present your case, says the Lord. Let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Declare us the things to come. Show the things that are coming hereafter that we may know that you are God's. He says, behold, the former things have come to pass. New things I declare. Before they spring forth, I will tell you. And he says, I am God. There is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. Okay? Do you want to serve that power instead of these other guys who say all sorts of hocus pocus? How about the one who knows our destiny, knows where we're going? Okay? Remember this, this old boring doctrine is more important what comes out of the mouth of, of whoever may contact you than the capabilities they can show. Because in Deuteronomy it says that there may rise above you a prophet or a dreamer that gives a sign or wonder, and it may even come to pass. Okay? But if he says, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and serve them, do not hearken to the words of the prophet. Even the fact that they do a miracle is not a sign of their, their gift. Okay? So I'm going to skip through some of these because I think some other uh, speakers are going to speak about this well. These are some of the different kind of things that uh, the world expects into the world. I think you would agree with me that there's a general feeling in the public that we're coming to a wrap-up of things. Even people who aren't believing in the Christian kind of thing, there's a, there's a sense that someone's coming on. Our TV shows reflect that. Okay? And, and they confess that as such. Okay? And, and there will be some wonderful blessings even within the church. There are going to be wonderful things that God is going to do in the church uh, and some movements, uh, things we can't explain. I, I don't want to be a wet blanket and say, if you see wonderful manifestations, well, everything is always terrible. God does his thing too, but he does it his way. When people uh, bring themselves to repentance and holiness, God will work. You will see amazing things in your life when you humble yourself before God. Okay? I personally believe, and this is something for another talk, that you could make an argument after my study from ancient of days that there, there could be possible explanations of what we call today UFOs or these gods or apparitions foretold in the Bible. And when you, it's very clearly in the Bible it says when the stars fall from heaven, and every theologian I know understands that to be the heavenly host falling down. When they're cast down before judgment, it says fearful things are going to come on the earth. Okay, It says they fall down as figs falling from a fig tree. And when Jesus says in Matthew 24, watch the parable of the fig tree, almost the, almost the next verse after that, you watch when the leaves are tender. It makes me just sort of wonder, are some of these isolated sightings and wonders we see some of that budding of the fig tree? When, when the fig tree really gets shaken and these heavenly hosts fall down and start going in mass? You better be close to the Lord. You better understand who's on what side. Okay? Here's some quotes. You can look at these later. Okay? The people on the other side have already said there's somebody coming. There is a leader. He's going to be so charismatic that if you don't know exactly what you believe, it's going to be so seductive you're going to be pulled right into it. Okay? And there's going to be a battle. Okay? It, this is not going to end quietly or nicely. It's going to end up violently. Okay? And whether it's the people I spoke to last year and the gods that they channel and they worship, that they confess to me they worship the Babylonian gods, or maybe some of them in the audience worship some of these gods, they're going to reach their end. And it's not going to come politely. It's going to come in violent destructions. He says, behold, I will punish the gods. Okay? And they're coming on the earth. Okay? I'm not going to dwell on this. This is something else that I'm exploring further. I, I believe when you, when you look at people like Dr. Heiser and others who will be speaking here, to talk about this whole concept of the heavenly host and the sons of God and the fact that judgment is coming upon them as said in Psalms. I believe there is a trial and we can see it in the first few chapters of the book of Revelation. We see a trial of Jesus before the priest in the Gospels. But there's going to be another trial and the shoe's going to be on the other foot. Rather than Sanhedrin, there are going to be 24 members and elders and all the iniquity and sins of the earth are going to be laid manifest. The economic, the religious the violent military, all those things are going to be done and there's not going to be one thing left unsolved. And it's going to be directed at the gods and their followers. Okay? But we have a bright hope. You can read this later. I know my time's up. God has wonderful plans for us. It says here, as many as received him, to him gave them the power to become the sons of God. And that's what these angelic beings hate, is that they're going to be thrown out of their job and they've got somebody replacing them one day. And one day when the Lord has 
has glorified each one of us. He has a wonderful and marvelous job for us that we can't imagine. And it says, as many as led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. And he says, this is a manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the sons of God. And the world knoweth us not. Okay? But we can't see it now. It says, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, Jesus, we shall be like him. Okay? So if any of you all, in closing, I just want to be fair with you and let you know what's going to happen to your gods if you're worshiping someone other than the, the God of, of Israel and, and the Holy One of God, Jesus Christ. But for the Chaldean of believing and, and the sorcerers, idolaters, they're going to be in a lake that burns with fire and brimstone. Nothing that practices these matters are going to be uh, written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And that's just the truth, and you need to hear it, okay? And one day they're going to look forth and see the corpses of the men that have transgressed against me. There's an abhorrence to all mankind. So in summary, thank you for your patience. Sorry I sounded like preaching here, but you had a lot of history at the beginning. I wanted to sort of process this a little bit. The biblical and non-biblical references agree that heaven and earth will reconnect. They just disagree on the causes and what's going to come out of it. The spirit entities have shown to not be immune to lying and deception, and even their followers admit it. Uh, but it requires reliable tools to discern. We've seen how complicated this can be, how deceptive. And it, it should be a priority of every one of us to identify that. And the question I'm asking each of you and all of our listeners who watch this DVD, who do you trust, why do you trust them, and how do you trust them? And the motives of these spirit contacts are most important to discern. You know, if somebody tries to sell us a used car, we will analyze their motives and what they're doing more than we will someone we worship. We spend more time with, our, with that than with our own spiritual teachers we have. Okay, the spirit guides, these other spirit guides can provide intelligence, even <coughs> healing and even other affirmations. Very wonderful things. But it's still not a confirmation of their benevolent motives. Okay, and some of the scriptures even I skip through here will confirm that. Okay, last slide here. Contact with spirit entities can be a blessing and a curse based upon several factors. What you're doing at the time, what are you doing before the Lord when that contact makes, and obviously who they are when they come to you. Okay, but the world has been impacted as a result, although the immediate and long-term effects have been very complex, as we've seen in that, our historical section. And that's the reason the Bible suggests extreme caution in these contacts. And you'll find even the prophets of old used extreme caution in discerning the spirits that contacted them. Okay? In, in my vernacular, picking the right horse to put your saddle on is of eternal consequence. You get one chance at it. Okay? I'm sorry there's no reincarnation. You don't get another shot. Um, if you have some proof of reincarnation, I'd like to see it. But it's wishful thinking. It appears to me that there's two sides. I think I can categorize all these contacts in one of two sides. Each has vastly different worldviews. Who are the bad guys? Who are the good guys? What are their destiny? And I would suggest that you look at the data to find who the reliable witnesses are aggressively. Spend a lot of your personal time studying this out, including people who say they're Bible teachers, and use humility and prayer. Recognize that your, your wisdom is limited and it's going to require God's wisdom, and that basically we all have to look out for each other. And this even goes, I mentioned these to the people who are not of the household of faith. People who are sincere truth seekers that are here, I and I know other people here love and care about you as well. And we, we all are fellow mankind, okay? We are subject to these higher powers, and we need to be concerned about each other and look out for each other. And I would wish for every one of you that you would use the utmost discernment and that you would pick wisely. And I'll just close with uh, probably this well-known concept, Chinese symbol for crisis. You look at the emblem, it's a combination of the emblem for danger and opportunity. Okay, and I've tried to talk about both. There is a tremendous danger in the crisis of contacting spirits from beyond and their messages of eternal contact. Recognize the danger, but also recognize the opportunity. That when you have a relationship with the trustworthy Heavenly Father and His Son who gave His life to die for you, gave His life, willing to come in the flesh to be amongst you, that there are tremendous opportunities as well, too. And I, I would wish those experience for all of you. Thank you very much.
things that really jumps out is they have a uh, new religious order that ministers can be ordained in. It's called the Order of the Transfiguration. And their slogan and what their purpose is, is that they're creating a new humanity for a new world order. Which is a very interesting slogan to pick. But their basic teaching and what they uh, train people to do are things like um, summoning the dead, communicating with angels, communicating with other entities, channeling and psychic behavior is part of the religious ordination which is very different than what I was familiar with from my, my Orthodox Christian upbringing. It's actually run by an uh, Anglican theologian uh, that runs the organization. I invited him to come on our show. And so we had a show. Yeah, he did come. Um, he was treated very well. But we asked very clearly about what some of their positions were versus what we understand to be in the Word of God. It was a very curious show uh, around December of 2007. And I uh, felt like that was probably going to be the end of it. Uh, all our shows are archived at futurequake.com, so if you want to hear them, you can just go there under the Past Shows tab. Well, I got a call not too long after that where I was invited by this uh, same gentleman to be a keynote speaker at an, an annual international conference they have. And this is a conference attended by all of the big names uh, in the field. Uh, we have uh, people that you may have heard of on Discovery Channel, or things like Sean David Morton, uh, people like Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, and a lot of people in ufology that speak. And in fact, if you look, and in fact, there's still an archive of the speakers on the brochure on, on their website from 2008, you'll see probably a good third or more are people related to ufology and the UFO religion that's growing. And so they're a big part of participating in this group. And so uh, I, after much prayer uh, and, and seeking uh, some, some wisdom from others, I, I agreed to accept their opportunity graciously. And I uh, went to Montreal, where, where the speech was, uh, took uh, Brother Chris, uh, one of my pastors from my church, with me. And uh, what we found out when we got there is, for our recollection, it's probably three or four, and I pray that they will find, and I just appreciate their uh, honest spirit to be here and to consider these things together. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to get started here. And uh, this is the talk we're going to give, and I, I need to give a little background of this. My... Um, scenario on how I was asked to speak is very different than the other speakers. Uh, Brother Guy, I happened to see this presentation that I gave actually just about exactly a year ago to a very unique group of people. Uh, and when he saw this and he saw the content, uh, he decided that it would fit in nicely to the content of this conference that's ongoing. And he asked me to present it. And I was thrilled uh, for that because uh, I, I hate to tell you you're getting leftovers because this is information actually has been updated uh, for this conference. But this is information that was presented to, again, a unique group of people. Um, I don't know, a year and a half ago or so, I was doing some research for my radio show, uh, and I uh, happened to stumble across this group called the International Institute of Integral Human Sciences. Very innocuous name, uh, not, not very descriptive. But, but I happened to discover that it was co-funded by the United Nations and the World Council of Churches, which is, which is very intriguing. You would think, well, if you've got a, a church institute and a, and a civil type group like the UN, it's probably something related to um, getting food for people or, or you know, some kind of help for people in destitute areas. It actually was a religious organization. It's, it's called an NGO, a non-governmental group or organization that actually are the kind of groups that really pull the weight in the United Nations. And this particular group that's funded by both institutions, actually in effect, and I'm paraphrasing here, is creating basically a new world religion. They're creating a new global religion as a political tool to help unite people together. And, and I, I recommend, if you're curious and looking more about this, go to iiihs.org, three iiihs.org, and you can read about it yourself because they're very straightforward on their website. Uh, and in fact, one of the things I've spoken about, uh, so, some of the more difficult things that are alluded to in the Bible, discussed in the Bible, and that are affecting our way of life today. But when I was in the audience seeing this wonderful, amazing teaching that actually brought me closer to the Bible, it actually uh, re-illuminated parts of the Bible that maybe we'd skipped over, you know, in my upbringing or Sunday school. And it helped me to have a deeper understanding of who God was, what his purpose was and his mission. And it was a, just a fully enriching experience. In fact, I remember seeing the Holy Spirit really move uh, amongst the group of people. I saw restorations of relationships. Uh, there was spiritual warfare that went on there. 
And I can remember uh, an older gentleman, friend of mine, who was a real mentor of mine, he and I just left here with our mouths open, just wondering what have we just experienced and what have we seen. And so that's something that I've taken with me, and it's really prepared me in the years since then. I think the Lord has really used it as a tool to help expand my eyes to what he's doing within the household of faith and in the body of Christ. And the folks that you hear speak here, I know they don't toot their own horns except maybe when the conference starts. Uh, <laughs> these are individuals that have sacrificed much. They don't have a institutional support behind them. They don't have uh, all of these other groups that are undergirding their activity. They do this because they have a passion and believe they're sharing God's truth as they seek to study together. And the other thing I've observed about this group is this group works together. I've been in a lot of groups, even in Bible prophecy, where everybody goes off in their own compartment and they sort of compete against each other and try to push books. This group works together. They get together, they compare notes, they try to study the Lord, they pray together, they lift each other up. And that's why it's such a privilege for me to be here today. And I just want to make sure that's on the record that uh, I just considered it an incredible opportunity when uh, Brother Guy asked me to come speak uh, the people here who speak are such incredible scholars in the work that they do. And in the radio show that I do, Future Quake, I try to make it a forum where people like them. Good morning, folks. Welcome to the Ancient of Days First Christian Symposium on Aliens. I'm Guy Malone, my wife and I of Alien Resistance Ministries. Welcome you, thank you for being here, and thank you for your early support as well. I can't tell you how proud and honored I am to have someone from my hometown of Nashville with such immense qualifications and a brilliant theological mind and an overall fun guy to be around. Please welcome up Dr. Michael J. Bennett. His PhD is in mechanical engineering, and we're honored very much to have him. Love you and bless you. You know, uh, I speak at a lot of technical and scientific conferences, and to my recollection, that's the first time I've been introduced with a shofar, and uh, I sort of like that. I think I'd like to take that with me. <laughs> that's a wonderful blessing, and it's something that I always associate with the Ancient of Days Conference. And I tell you, it's, it is uh, a group of people and an experience that is near and dear to my heart. Now, I don't know if many of you all are new, and this is your first experience here to Ancient of Days, but I came as an attendee in 2005. Uh, I've been raised in a very mainstream Christian environment, Christian home, uh, Baptist background, a wonderful Bible teaching, wonderful experience. But for all of the wonderful teaching, uh, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to encounter when I came here in 2005 with a list of what I consider now historic speakers. And over the time of being here for that conference, uh, I recognized that the Lord was doing something very wonderful with this community of people. And, and only part of it was related to the content of themselves and in other cutting edge topics, they have a forum to come and reach a mainstream Christian audience that we reach in Nashville, Tennessee in the, in the greater Mid-South area where we actually are on a, a conventional uh, Christian radio station. Uh, the Lord gave us a four o'clock drive time every day where we can bring topics you don't hear elsewhere on Christian radio. And I think that's really what this conference embodies, uh, is talking about issues that should be talked about, that should be conversed amongst Christians. It helps better prepare us for the days that we're in. And I wanna thank each of you, the uh, people who are attending today. You've, you've made great effort to be here, and I want to thank you for being here, and also even the people who may be watching these DVDs. These DVDs go out to so many places, uh, so many people see them and observe them, and I know they have the same transformational thoughts that I did when I first heard this information. And I, and I also want to thank them for taking the time to watch this information, and the rest of the speakers that you'll hear as well in this conference throughout the DVDs. Uh, I, I would... Uh, if you don't mind, before I get into meat and potatoes and information, I'd like to say a quick word of prayer because the information I'm going to show you is, for me, very co complex, complicated and complex. Uh, and uh, I want to make sure that it's presented in a way that's fruitful and that honors Christ. And uh, I want to thank anybody here who's not part of the household of faith. 
that uh, was curious when he saw an advertisement about this, he wanted to set in. I just want to let you know I appreciate you being here and respect you and respect you as a true seeker. And I hope you find something useful from what you hear. So if you don't mind, let's just say a quick word. Heavenly Father, I, I thank you so much for the privilege of studying your word and studying what's going on in the world and your hand in it. Uh, Heavenly Father, I just pray as a speaker that I would not say anything that would uh, express falsely upon you or an untruth or an information that would not express your will or who you are. Uh, and Lord, I just pray that this would not be a stumbling block, but rather a stepping stone uh, in the spiritual growth and journey of everyone who hears it. Lord, I pray for, for those who are of faith, that they would be strengthened, and those uh, who are seekers, uh, that they would experience the promise you make that those who seek will find.